Okay, well, it is noon, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. So hopefully everyone can hear me who is on the call. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. So thanks for attending today's McEwen Celebrate Month of Scholarship. Um, I'm Kathy Miller. I'm from the Faculty of Nursing. I'm one of the new chairs in that uh, faculty. And I'll start by reading the land acknowledgement. So I would uh, acknowledge that the land on which we gather in Treaty 6 territory is the traditional gathering place for many Indigenous people. We honour and respect the history, languages, ceremonies and cultures of the First Nations, Métis and Inuit who call this territory home. The First People's connection to the land teaches us about our inherent responsibility to protect and respect Mother Earth. With this acknowledgement, we honor the ancestors and children who have been buried here, missing and murdered Indigenous women and men, and the process of ongoing collective healing for all human beings. We are reminded that we, were, we are all treaty people and have the responsibility we have to one another. So today we are joined by Dr. Heather Fitzsimmons Fay. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Arts and Cultural Management Program. And we're excited for a presentation, Young People, the Past, Reenactment, and the Future. Uh, if you have any questions, you can add them in the Q&A, and I will uh, manage them after the presentation. So, Dr. Dempsey, take it away. Oh, sorry, not Dr. Dempsey. That was the last one I did. <laughs> Dr. Fitzsimmons Fay, take it away. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. So my name is Heather. I use she, her pronouns. And as Kathy said, I teach arts and cultural management at McEwen. And I've got long hair and I'm wearing um, a navy blue shirt today. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm here on Treaty 6 territory in Amiskwichi, Wasquehegan, Edmonton. I think it's important to acknowledge this when we're gathering together in virtual space that we could be coming from different places. But I'm here in Treaty 6 and I'm grateful for the land, which is the ultimate resource in supporting all of our endeavors. I recognize First Nations, Inuit and Métis caretakers of this land, past, present and future. And I would also like to thank the caretakers of many lands, both near and far, whose territories support the infrastructures that make gathering today in virtual space possible. So I'm gonna try sharing my screen and then can you let me know if that's working, please? Is that working now? Do you see my screen? Yes, it is working. Oh, great. Okay, that's wonderful. So I'm honored to be here with you today to talk about aspects of my research and my research methodologies and some of the work that I've been doing during the pandemic. Broadly speaking, my research focuses on the arts, performance, and young people, especially girls, and I will talk more about that term in a few minutes, in contemporary and historic contexts. To do the research, I use archives, qualitative research, practice-based methodologies, and performance-based historiography. And today I'm going to talk about how and why I think performance is such an important way to get at certain kinds of ideas, particularly when the histories address those, like children and adolescents, who are frequently neglected by the mainstream historical record. Over time, my research has demonstrated that A, privileging action reveals information and questions that would not be illuminated by reading alone, B, embodied practice means that research can be led by what bodies know and what bodies feel, rather than only what people intellectualize about its experiences. And C, performance-based inquiries with young people or other people excluded from mainstream accounts of history highlights their interests, insights, and questions about the past in a multivocal, multi-perspective way. D, performance-based inquiries with young people not only have the potential to change how we understand the past and young people in the past, they have the potential to provide insights into lived experiences of young people in the present, which can actually, ultimately, shift narratives about them in the present, as well as about the youth in the past. And then E, this is most exciting of all, when young people perform the past, the way they discuss the past, can become an activist space, which ultimately will change the future. So here's 
how. I will start with a story. Several years ago, when I was working on my dissertation concerning 19th century amateur juvenile at-home theatricals, I read Ju uh, Florence Bell's 1896 book, Fairy Tale Plays and How to Act Them. Most of the book is play scripts, but there is a long introduction at the beginning that explains practical things about putting on a play at home, such as how to rig up a stage curtain in your house, how to build an ogre mask, how to help child and youth actors improve on stage. Bell writes, in the following introduction, some very obvious and elementary suggestions have been made on the subject of putting amateur plays for children on to the stage, with some equally obvious remarks on the demeanor and deportment of the performers. Bell also includes wonderful illustrations of common deportment flaws among children and helpfully advises such things as a kind of fin-like flapping of the hand and forearm is the ordinary gesture of the English boy or girl. On the whole, amateurs are probably saved in trying to gesticulate less rather than more and in avoiding vague intermittent and meaningless movement of the hand and arms. As I was thinking about the document, written over 100 years ago, I wondered, are Bell's suggestions obvious and elementary today? How do Bell's remarks on demeanor and deportment of the performers resonate with bodies today? How does it feel to do the things she describes? Do Florence Bell's criticisms and comments feel familiar? Do they make sense? How do her gender and age differentiations make meaning today? I pitched a research workshop at the Canadian Association for Theatre Research Conference. At the workshop, the conference participants and I worked through as many questions as I could in 20 minutes. If we were in a room together today, I might ask some of you to try the gestures yourselves. One of Bell's descriptions I remember was completely baffling to me until a conference participant read the description, slouched, and jutted out her hip in the attitude of a teenager lazing near a bus stop, daring you to remind them that they have to go to school. I learned a lot from the workshop. I learned answers to many of the questions that I had about the manual, but more significantly, I learned some key insights about this methodology. Performance-based historiography, as the mode of inquiry is called, although I didn't know it at the time, is a powerful research tool because A, it privileges the body over the intellect, asking participants to do and to animate or activate texts in order to understand them. B, it welcomes affective discoveries. How does it feel to do the actions? What does feeling help us know? And C, doing raises many more questions than I had originally brought to the study. And doing with others means that a multivocal questioning of the past is possible. One of the questions I immediately had after that first conference was, how would my research, which was about children and young people, be different if the participants were, in fact, children and young people. Doing performance-based research with young people, as I will explain, centers their voices, their perspectives, and creates a structure in which their concerns drive the inquiry. And that, as I have learned, has implications not only for how we understand the past, but also how we understand young people's current lived experiences and how we can imagine the future. To foster conditions for this youth-led, youth-centered inquiry, I focus on what I call encounters, where young people of the 21st century could briefly encounter young people of the past by doing the activities and actions they did. When I'm doing historical research, I'm particularly interested in how young people today engage with young people who might have been their peers in the past. What do they want to know? What questions do they raise? Historian Jackie Bratton calls these present-minded questions because they're drawn from contemporary concerns. Bratton points out that as we ask present-minded questions, we need to avoid present-minded answers about the past. However, as I work with young people, I have discovered that the young people generate a range of answers and knowledge based on the work we do together. They expose meaningful threads of inquiry about the past, all the while deepening understandings about young people today. I asked, how does centering young people in the inquiry process through performance change what we ask and change what we learn? I practiced working with children and teens with archival performance materials, exploring dance steps, 
costumes, and my assumptions. And I've been sharing some slides from some uh, 19th century acting charades workshops that I did with some students. Here's another one that I did where we recreated an 1896 home piece called The Frog Prince. They're obviously singing a song here. In August of 2018, days before I moved to Edmonton, the Institute for Dance Studies at the University of Toronto sport supported me with a half day of studio space to join their performance research pop-up series. I was inspired by a research pop-up I attended by dance scholar Selma Odom, and I told Seika Boy and the Institute that I had specific questions I wanted to explore about dance steps and conventions described in archival documents. However, I didn't just want to work with university students. One thing that was important to me was incorporating the multiple ages that were included in definitions of Victorian middle-class girlhood, whose families expected them to spend time together in family gatherings over the chilly winter holidays older girls teaching and organizing activities for the younger ones. Victorians had a narrow and normative view of middle-class girlhood. They used the term girl to describe anyone who appeared to be female and who was unmarried, but still considered marriageable. Ideally, girls were expected to be dependent on their fathers, whereas women were dependent on their husbands. In practice, this more or less included ages five to 25. So I recruited this lovely group of volunteers who self-identified as girls. One significant insight I gained that enhanced how I understood the value performance as a research tool resulted because of an incredibly silly 19th century game we played as a warm-up called forfeits. Rules varied in the 19th century, but it was essentially a truth or dare game. In our version, participants would do something that everyone would have to then repeat. The little girl's exuberance granted the older girl's permission of the older girl participants permission to be silly and very active and soon everyone was laughing and goofing around knowing that this was a very popular a game among victorian middle classes made the girls start to rethink their ideas about stiff formal victorians and then i asked the girls if they would like to try on corsets that even children in the middle classes wore we didn't have a full costume supply of corsets in the right sizes, and the ones we had came from multiple eras and styles. Not all girls were interested in trying them on, but some did, and they told them that they were surprised at how they felt. They felt secure and supported, that the corsets were not as restrictive as they expected, that they observed that specific movements were limited. For example, they couldn't bend from side to side. When we debriefed the workshop, the dancing, and some ideas about performance in Victorian girls, playing forfeits and trying on corsets were two ways that girls began to develop body-led, feeling-based questions about girls' lives and girls' performance practices in the past. How could they reconcile wearing corsets with the silly, exuberant games? The workshop taught me something powerful that I brought with me to my work in Edmonton, where young people are led by what their bodies know and what their bodies feel doing activities. They not only question ideas they have about the historically located activity and about the young people who participated in it in the past, they begin to think about their own lives and their own relationship to the past. A scholar named Rebecca Schneider, who studies living history reenactments like Civil War reenactments, talks about the fold of time and the power of a repeated moment and claims that through gesture, people can briefly touch time. Doing the past opens up that possible encounter. For the remainder of my talk, I'm going to discuss two projects I've been working on since I came to McE McEwen that demonstrate how powerful doing performance history research with young people can be. I've had the privilege of working with incredible research assistants on these projects who have been helping me to understand and to think through how performance-led methodologies generate youth-centered, youth-driven knowledge that truly shifts not only how we understand Alberta's past, but how we need to rethink our present. First, I will discuss the Stepping Together Encounters. Stepping Together starts with archival documents. On the surface, the focus of the inquiry is the 1911 Strathcona Trust Syllabus of Physical Exercises for Schools, a textbook that school boards across Canada adopted for their physical culture programs in the early 20th century. Drills in the program featured symmetrical and asymmetrical strength-based poses performed in march time, which is two-four time, or waltz time, three-quarter time, usually in unison. Here's an image of the Barnum drill done in waltz time while using a staff. 
The syllabus claimed to promote positive physical and educational effects and adherence to values related to the cheerful adoption of discipline, order, accuracy, and precision. At the same time, and later, critics described the formal exercises of the syllabus as militaristic and joyless. And yet, girls who voluntarily participated in girl guides in the early 20th century chose to perfect and present drills, which raises doubts as to whether they agreed with these critics. When I visited the Girl Guides of Canada National Archive, I encountered photographs of girl guides between 1915 and 1922 voluntarily performing drills. Drills were also mentioned in local newspaper articles, and one Girl Guide program from Cochrane, Alberta in 1914 nestled among a variety of play playlights, no, pardon me, nestled among a variety of playlets was a witch's march and broom drill. When guides performed drills using their own choreography, they could repurpose the apparently rigid systems that the syllabus encouraged young people to embrace, which allowed the Cochrane guides to approach the activity whimsically, as witches, with their brooms. Performing drills also allowed girls to publicly demonstrate skills and strength that tended to be the purview of boys. By imagining drills as more than part of a fitness regimen, and rather as a performative collective creative action, I used performance-based historiography workshops to reconsider potentially girl-driven presentational, preparational, and creative aspects of drills. The first workshop was held at the end of January in, 19, or in 2020 at a space in Allard Hall. Girls aged 7 to 12 read the syllabus and tried to interpret the instructions without an expert to guide them, and then invented their own drills together using syllabus movement vocabulary. Far from joyless, the girls seemed to take great pleasure developing a routine and exploring the potential of the syllabus. They also talked about ways this work was considered militaristic in the past and compared the activity to their own experiences with soccer, hip hop, ballet, gymnastics, and other sports and performance disciplines. Performing the drills confirmed my suspicion that as one 12 year old participant noted, what matters is the approach. Girls could have embraced or contested militarism and discipline associated with the drills through their own creative responses while showcasing strength as a group of girls. As you know, plans to create further encounters to unpack these drills were complicated by the pandemic. As I tried to reimagine how we could have encounters if we couldn't share space, I realized that if we used Zoom, 21st century girls could not only be reaching across time and space to connect with girls 100 years ago, they would be reaching across virtual space to connect with girls in the 21st century as well. And somehow that made sense. With the help of my research assistant, Jenna Karakis, then 19 years old, and according to definitions 100 years ago, a girl herself, we developed a plan that placed girls' physical action and girls' ideas at the center of the inquiry. In phase one, Jenna imagined conditions to parallel a girl guide in rural Alberta in about 1914. She studied the syllabus movement vocabulary in the absence of other resources to mirror probable conditions of early 20th century Alberta girls. And then she developed her own drill. Although drill was on the official Alberta curriculum, early 20th century teacher recruitment and retention was so spotty, especially in rural areas, that it cannot be assumed that girls had any effective training in drill at school. In Jenna's field notes, she recorded the frustrations and triumphs of creating a drill, feelings she believes were common for girls who encountered the syllabus as she did. She wrote, I think the most difficult part of the manual is the vocabulary they use. There are so many different ways I could interpret the instructions. Each drill movement can be associated with the command. Right now, my commands are very mechanical and separated as I try to place my body in the position it's telling me. Some specific phrases were confusing as well. Like ankle stretched, what does that even mean? Do they mean to push the ankle out or to let the ankle lead? The next research phase included eight Zoom-based physical culture workshops with 23 girls from Edmonton and the surrounding area. In phase two, Jenna taught girls aged 12 to 19 syllabus movement vocabulary and a drill that she developed. In phase three, she taught different girls aged seven to 22 the movement vocabulary and then had participants collaborate to choreograph and perform their own drill. After each workshop, Jenna led a debriefing discussion. 
Jenna and I were inspired by girls' powerful insights about drills, sports, and gender. But right now I want to focus on two kinds of insights that were made possible through performance, and this year, through the particular conditions of performance during this pandemic. Thinking about rural and settler girls, isolated on the farm or the ranch, led participants to make connections between those girls and their own current feelings associated with being stuck because of enforced isolation. When we were discussing isolation, eight-year-old Sapling heard the root word as ice and explained that to isolate means to be frozen, to be stuck, to put ice around something so you go around it, so it's separate, so you can't move. Connecting her sense of isolation to the winter weather that has been an isolating factor across generations in Alberta. Jenna's Zoom hosted workshops made geographic and temporal barriers more porous, and most participants articulated that moving together in a shared creative and physical activity with a common goal established connections between and among them. In fact, the girls' experiences with the workshop suggest that one significant probable appeal of the drills in the early 20th century may have been the opportunity to move together and to make something creative with other girls. Girls noted that drilling together worked to combat feelings associated with isolation. Drilling meant a shared creative goal and fostered connections with other girls in a meaningful and active way. Our participants explained that it changed their impressions of girls 100 years ago and of the activities they did. One participant declared, I had no idea girls were doing workouts like the guys back then. Another observed with increased respect for 20th century girls that guides had to be disciplined, synchronized and dedicated to their sport. Others, like the Robinson sisters, explained in their questionnaire, when we went into it thinking it would just be a goofy experience of reliving the past, but realized that it was a fun way to spend time with other girls. This made us realize that despite ideas of sports and community organizations changing, we probably weren't that different after all. Our participants' experiences performing and doing the drills with one another on Zoom led them to act per ask provocative questions about how the drills connected to early 20th century girls' lives. Not only were these girl-centered questions focused on the participants' connections to age peers, they were enhanced by their experiences of performing the drills. In creating and doing the drills, these participants called back girl-centered body-led questions to the past. Striking poses helped participants rethink their perceptions about what they had thought of as proper stiff girls of 100 years ago and revisioned them in action. Participants also wondered about girls of the past in terms of how they felt doing the drills and if past girls felt as though participating meant that they were challenging perceptions of girls in sports. They wondered about the impact of girls on drills, drills on girls' lives. What did they imagine they would do with those skills in the future? Asked 16 year old Dorothy. How did discipline they learned to follow affect their home life or relationships? Asked Bethany. Pebbles wondered who had authority over the others when they were drilling and what they would do if someone did not want to participate. These girls also discussed the social implications of the patriarchal world that girls occupy. The Robinson sisters wished that they could ask early 20th century girl guides, did you get bullied for doing sports and gymnastics because you were a girl? Our participants' questions about power dynamics, social interaction, and gender equity suggest that 2020 girls connected to past girls through social issues girls face rather than the mechanics of the movement vocabulary. Yet embodying the drills prompted girls to examine how the drilling made them feel and how feeling made them think. In asking provocative questions about the past, these girls demonstrated their potential to shift perceptions of how historically located and contemporary girls are imagined in the past, today, and even in the future. And this brings me to the other project I want to discuss today. Young people are the future, youth volunteers representing settler and indigenous pasts at Fort Edmonton Park. Fort Edmonton Park, as many of you may know, is a living history museum featuring historically dressed staff and volunteers. They animate spaces and streets that represent the 1834 fort, Edmonton in 1885, Edmonton in 1905, and Edmonton in 1920 to 30. You may also know that the park has been closed for renovations since 2019, in part because they're developing an Indigenous people's experience area that focuses on life in Amiskwichi or Beaver Hills pre-settler contact. 
Alongside paid staff, Fort Edmonton Park's team of hundreds of historically dressed, individually registered volunteers, aged six weeks to older adult, act as interpreters for visitors, present historically located skills such as scraping hides or cooking on a wood stove, teach dance steps and games, perform semi-improvised skits, exploring issues such as women's suffrage, and populate the historic buildings so that the museums come alive. Since interpreters offer a kind of performance of the past at the park, performance is also key here to understanding how young people are representing and relating to Edmonton's histories. At the park, we have learned how performance illuminates young people's perspectives of the past and young people's understandings of themselves and their world in the present. In addition, what is especially exciting in this project is that young people in historical dress at Fort Edmonton Park create activist spaces where young people shift perspectives on what matters in the past. And while they do that, they also have the potential, as I've mentioned, to change the future. At Fort Edmonton Park, young people volunteer in historical dress through one of three programs. Children from birth to 18 can volunteer as members of a family in which adult caregivers, usually parents, are park volunteers. They can volunteer as junior historical, or sorry, junior costumed historical interpreters. These are age 13 to 17. Or they can volunteer as junior Indigenous peoples interpreters, also age 13 to 17. Those who participate with their families volunteer with their family unit, representing, for example, a family in the 1885 tent city. The juniors volunteer as individuals and are assigned a mentor who provides guidance and training in historical and contemporary skill development. Junior Indigenous Peoples interpreters can currently study eight weeks of modular programming, which explores topics like era-specific clothing and regalia, artifacts and craft, and asks young people to go back to their communities and families to discuss how and if the information resonates with their own lives. Along with the project research assistants, Tanya Gigliotti, Sean Herbert, and Tannis Redcrow, we interviewed 26 young people, two mothers and one grandfather about their experiences. On-site interviews, which would have allowed participants to show us, as they told us about their Fort Edmonton Park experiences, were impossible because in 2019, the park was closed for renovations. And then, of course, we had the pandemic. Our interviews were done in person in 2019 and online via video chat in 2020, with volunteers choosing their own pseudonyms to remain anonymous. Because of these limitations, young people discussed their performances rather than making performance a part of the research methodology. Today, I have time to discuss two ways that our young participants have revealed how they create activist spaces in Fort Edmonton Park. I wish I had time to share more, but Tanya Gigliotti and I have two publications forthcoming in which we go into more detail about these ideas. So first, youth volunteers in historic dress at Fort Edmonton Park use a tool called flexible interpretation, which allows them to shift from first person voice to third person voice. They can make comments in character, such as, hello, welcome to our garden, or they can step out of character and comment on their own performance and their own perspectives on the past that they are representing, much like our other performance research participants do when they engage in debriefing. When youth volunteers slide between first and third person interpretation, they're engaging with visitors, essentially an audience, and as they have conversations with them, they have the opportunity to challenge visitors to look at the past differently, and consequently, change Edmonton's future. In respectful conversation with visitors, powerful youth-led questions and interpretations of the past create activist spaces. Let me give you some examples of how this works in practice. Youth volunteers are constantly confronting visitor assumptions. Visitors come to the park with ideas about what the past was like, what young people were like in the past, and what gender behavior expectations were and Indigenous settler relations were like. Visitors also bring their ideas about what youth are and should be today. Métis siblings Evelyn and McCloven told us that occasionally they encounter people they call uninformed visitors at the park. These visitors make inaccurate comments about the past, sometimes to educate their companions. Common ones are assuming that Fort Edmonton was a military fort, which it was not, or imagining that the fort was dominantly a settler space, when in fact all the women and children in the fort were Indigenous and Métis, and much of the year when men were traveling, a significant majority of the residents were in fact women and children. Sometimes uninformed visitors make uncomfortable sexist or racist remarks. 
The visitors may even believe that they are playing along with youth performances, but these kinds of comments are inappropriate in any era. McLovin told us that the young volunteers work with their mentors to, as he put it, learn how to take care of it in a proper manner. But learning how to deal with sexism and racism is difficult. Avalon told us that at 13, a visitor joked that she should get on her knees and scrub the floor. She told us that she, he, she knew he was joking and that it was inappropriate, but it was hard to know how to react. Another JV who called herself R told us, I mean, the biggest one that's super cringy that you probably get every day is, are you single? Where's your husband? What are you wearing under those clothes? Initially, youth volunteers approach mentors to learn how to deal with these tense moments or uninformed behaviors, but gradually they learn to employ the flexible interpretive style to step out of first person and create dialogue with these visitors, using the comment as a jumping off point to share information about what life was really like in the past and also about what's appropriate behavior today. Another key way that youth volunteer performances at Fort Edmonton Park create activist spaces happens because youth volunteers are encouraged to make the narratives they think are important a part of the visitors' interactions at the park. Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth volunteers offer narratives with highly charged personal meanings. For example, Edith, age 13, explained that she brings her own family story and her own views of what people need to learn about Edmonton's true history to her exchanges with visitors. She told us, there's been so many mistakes about like exclusion and people doing very awful things to other people. And if we don't look at that and recognize that, it's just gonna happen again in some form. Like I know that my way back past, like my great, great grandmother came from Ukraine. She came here and like, and there were so many things that happened where I think they weren't welcomed. And I think that people didn't, like a lot of people don't know that, but I know that at my school and like all through elementary school, nobody has ever talked about that, like the Ukrainian internment camps. And I think that's very wrong. Edith created a personal backstory to answer visitor questions about why a young girl like her was working on the midway, while her own great grandmother did not work on a midway when her brother was sent to an internment camp, she struggled to make ends meet on their farm it would have been a plausible reason to go and work there at the Midway. Other young people told us that their conversations with visitors created spaces to talk about stereotypical projections of girlhoods in the past and present, to talk about residential schools, to talk about Asian Canadian experiences, sustainable transportation networks in Edmonton, and a range of other topics that matter to them. Because young people are performing the past, we argue that it changes how it's possible. Oh, for some reason, my slides aren't sharing for you. Huh? Oh, dear. There you go. Okay. Here we go. Because young people are performing the past, we argue that it changes how it's possible to imagine the past. If people alter the stories they associate with the past, Edmonton's history actually shifts. As Rebecca Schneider puts it, sideways. But equally powerful is the fact that young people's performances alter perceptions of what's important, and that can change what's important to our community now, and even more significantly, what becomes important as we make further choices that shape and develop our future. These are the activist spaces that are made possible through an action-oriented performance experience, where doing and feeling are significant aspects of what people know. To conclude my talk today, I'd like to point out that this is just a snippet of some of the big ideas that my research and assistants and I have been working through over the past little while, and I hope it's thought-provoking in any case. Performance-based historiography means using performance to develop knowledge and questions about history. Performance reveals something in the doing that cannot be revealed by reading archives alone. It privileges action. Instead of privileging intellectual responses, it places the emphasis on what the body knows, how doing makes a person feel, and how feeling changes the questions that matter. I am really interested in what young people know and what they care about and how their perspectives generate questions. Historically speaking, babies, children, and adolescents are too often ignored in the historical record. In the field of drama, theater, and performance studies, Earlier performance histories often generate generalized youth experiences, allowing boys' experiences, especially white boys' experiences, to stand in for the experiences of everyone. Being specific or inclusive and multivocal in the approach matters. Often, when diverse youth experiences are taken into account in performance research, the analysis is adult-led. Young people's ideas and perspectives do not lead the conversation. 
much more frequently discussions concerning young people are about them, but not with them. When young people lead the inquiries with their body-led questions and insights, that shifts them from the margins to the center. These research projects confirm that performance is a powerful way to create knowledge about the past, to change how we understand the present and to influence our possible futures. It's a particularly powerful way to centralize voices that were previously marginalized in the historical record and whose voices are often kept out of mainstream discourses today. By focusing on what people do and how that makes participants feel, conversations can be action-led and body-led and can focus on what participants find meaningful and on the questions that encounters lead them to ask. And finally, by reflecting on performance and on the tensions performance makes apparent, we can have valuable conversations about the futures that we want to create. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fitzsimmons Frey. That was very interesting. And I've never really thought about work at uh, Fort Edmonton in quite the same way. So thank <laughs> you for that. No problem. I think I'll stop sharing my screen now. I've left my logos up for a while. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. So for anyone who has questions for Dr. Fitzsimmons Frey, uh, you can add, add them in the, uh, the chat or the q and if you, if you click on the three little dots, in the chat, you'll see the Q and A, and I will ma uh, moderate the questions. So, any, we'll open it up for questions now. Oh, Craig, uh, yeah. Sorry, I got to figure this out here. Hang on. <laughs> it's okay, Kathy. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead uh, with your question. Uh, thanks very much for that, Heather. That that, that was excellent. Um, it's 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 probably more of a I guess a comment than a question. But I mean, one of the things that we are trying to figure out is what is our role as a downtown campus, and we know that a challenge in living downtown a lot of times is access to green spaces. Um, and I think COVID showed us how that is particularly a problem, and that you know if you're out in the suburbs, people can get out for walks, well for runs, well gyms, and, and places where they get activity are closed. But if you live downtown in a condo and your gym's closed because of COVID protocols, people are probably getting a little bit, uh, <laughs> getting a bit of muscular entropy. Um, and, you know, I really like the way you showcase the past because, you know, I would think, and I'm not a historian, so kind of, this is more the question, you know, it seemed like a lot of the, the historical pictures you showed us, people just sort of incorporated this end of the day, they did these things. And I guess the question is, is there any way we can use sort of what you showed us and try to use it as a way to help us better understand how to get, you know, get kind of the downtown core more active today? Like, is there a way that we can leverage, you know, what we did in the past, probably without people really thinking about it to kind of get today's society active, I guess is the question. <laughs> what a fun question. It's so interesting to think about how we might take some of those lessons from, you know, physical activity and so forth in the past. But I think it was actually very um, intentional. And the curriculums that were developed, curricula that were developed were really um uh, quite specific about the work that you were supposed to do. And I don't know, it's exactly similar, but my grandmother attended school for teachers when uh, would have been, I guess, in the 30s, probably, or not late 1920s. And she learned exercises, these kinds of exercises, I assume, that she continued to do for her entire life, every day. So I think that there's something to be learned, perhaps, in that kind of discipline that was there. But I think it's also just really important to know that um, play-based activities, which I know that the early learning at McEwen espouses so fully, are really important as well. And that some of these things could be fun. And, you know, they remind me of uh, ballet drills or even soccer drills, the kinds of warm up activities that we do. But it's also really important to celebrate feel free play and to try to find ways to, I don't know, get down into the river valley and pick up some sticks and chuck them in the river or something. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And man, maybe, you know, I know, uh, I unfortunately don't have a teaching load these days, but those people in the classroom, you know, maybe one thing to do is Every 20 minutes in your class, you show you know, 
get up and exercise and all the students get up and do some arm circles. Yeah. Do two minutes of <laughs> arm circles and deep knee bends. <laughs> and then go sit yeah. back down, back onto the lecture. Yeah. 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 Well, I have been in quite a few meetings now where people do incorporate a stretch break and I'm very grateful for that. I think it does. It's nice to have that kind of, um, disciplined required to get up and stretch because otherwise we yeah. sit so much, right? Yeah. Okay. I, I was just thinking that in terms of working from home and how, you know, you can spend hours sort of ho hurt, hunt, hunched over looking at your computer and how I could benefit from doing some of these activities. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying. There's something in the chat here, and I'm just trying to get it here. Maybe if I close this and look at the chat. <laughs> this is very challenging. Okay. This is a comment. It said, love your research at Fort Edmonton and how transformative acting out the past could be. Can you tell more about this? That is the question. Sure. Um... That's a wonderful and broad question. Thanks for asking it. It's great to have an opportunity to talk a little bit more about the really fantastic community partnership that we have there. And I think that one of the really special things that we've been learning more about is the relationship of costume to what's been possible at the park. So you may know that Fort Edmonton Park really works hard to have um, historically accurate costume pieces for people, which, you know, they still let young people wear braces and things like that. It's not like authenticity and accuracy takes control, but it's a, it's a really important part of their, um, their interaction with the public and they learn to talk about their, what they're wearing. So um, if they're wearing something that's more uh, like regalia, if they're an indigenous volunteer, then they learn how to talk about the various pieces and the beadwork that might be included, or if they're um, working in the 1905 era, then they're going to be talking about what kinds of uh, layers that they might have. But what we've also found that's really interesting is that the costumes change the audience, the visitor's relationship to the young people. And it seems to give them a special kind of an authority. It ages them up a bit. Um, people seem to trust them. And that creates a really special relationship with the audience as well. I think it gives the young people more authority and their words carry more weight. Their questions carry more weight. I hope that that's a little bit more about that, how that relationship works. Um, the young people at the park also sometimes learn skits and they do sort of semi-improvised skits that they work on. I know that there's one that is um, quite controversial that they do that's about eugenics as well and the eugenics movement that happened in early 20th century Alberta. And so it's not all uh, fun and fluffy, but there's also one that's about like a medicine snake oil salesman. So they do learn some skits as well as the kind of improvised work that they create. Uh, thank you for that. And it, if for those of you who are asking this, these questions, if you would like to ask follow up, please do that in the chat and we'll certainly get those up. Uh, here is another question for you. It says, you talked about the future implications of this embodied research and the activist potentials. How do you define activism in this context? And how can research support further understanding of the impacts of physical culture long-term for girls? Oh, well, I'm glad you're answering that. <laughs> my goodness, what a wonderful multi-layered question. Let's see if I can hit some of those spaces. So uh, there's been, I am, I am not, a uh, physical education expert, I want to start by saying that, but I've been reading a lot of really exciting research in the physical education arena, trying to look at what contemporary girls are doing, as well as girls of the past, and how that's been changing. And I think that we all know that it's still frustrating that girls, especially once they reach their teen years, seem to um, experience a different relationship with their bodies and with sports and that that can be complicated in schools and they have to work hard or differently to create supportive environments for young people. So that's one aspect of your question. And we've been looking at some of the implications of those research into how we might have interpreted some of the things that the girl guides of the early 20th century doing that was kind of counterculture to what boys were doing at that time or what other girls were doing and then more aligned with boys. 
Um, in terms of activism and activist potential, there's a couple of scholars. One I really like, Carolyn Caron, who cautions people like me against claiming that their research can create social change. And I really think about her work a lot. I think it's important to not uh, overemphasize what's possible, but to still think about ways that asking questions can make these kinds of incremental shifts for our participants and then the people with people with whom our participants interact in the future. So one of the things that I like to think about is if young people are asking us to think about people, young people in the past as agents, you start to think about the fact that young people in the past made a difference in the past, that the things that they did mattered. And if young people in the past made a difference, you see them actively doing something in a girl guide kind of event, or maybe in the Fort Edmonton Park context, they were actively doing things, then that means that young people are actively doing things today, which perhaps means that we should pay more attention to them. And we've all been paying attention to the Greta Thunbergs of the world and so forth. But I think that it's it's an important thing to consider that that sort of pushes their voices forward uh, and amplifies them, maybe. Oh, I hope that that answers some of your question. That was a complicated one. <laughs> Ah, thank you for that. That was very interesting. Uh, sh uh, the, the, the she says, thanks, Heather. That was a great answer. So, yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering, uh, it, I can't see any more questions in either the chat or the Q&A, so I'm going to ask my own question, if I may be so sure. bold. It was really interesting how you depicted activities of girl guides around the turn of the century. And I'm curious what impact, if any, this had on your study participants and their views of Girl Guides and whether there was any uh, interest in somehow being a part of that organization or how it changed what they thought about it. The relationship with the official Girl Guides of Canada is, is a fascinating aspect of this study. So. Um, when I went to the Girl Guides of Canada National Archives, I looked at a lot of the different kinds of activities that young people were doing um, originally. And of course, I encountered stuff like chopping wood and lighting fires and, you know, going camping in the bush and trying to uh, do things just like the boys did. Great letters where girls are saying, we're going to be just as tough as them. Don't you, you know, ham us in. Don't make us do it the way that we're supposed to. They also did tons of plays, lots and lots of plays for fundraisers for the Red Cross, which is how I originally kind of got interested in looking at their performance activities. Um, one of my most favorite performances that they did as a item in fundraisers was first aid drills <laughs> where they would they <laughs> would um you know this is close to world war one time and and they would have somebody in the middle of a field kind of surrounded by our audience and the girls would have to run out onto the field and rescue them make a makeshift stretcher right away and get them off the field and bandage them it was kind of like a speed drill thing it seemed like it was a spectator <laughs> sport there was one really great picture of two girls that grabbed two nearby bicycles and rigged up a kind of like a chariot to run the person across the field on. It's brilliant. So knowing about those things, I, we would share some of these details, these performance details with our participants. And they got this much more active, much more uh, involved kind of view of what girl guides were like and what they were trying to do and what they were trying to become during the early days when there weren't really clear age limits and there wasn't really, it was just for girls, you know, like lots of girls, whoever wanted to be there. I think lots of girls were bringing their younger sisters along. So I think it was a very multi-age sort of thing in those first 10 years. And, um, and so some of our girls were girl guides who were participating in these workshops. And so they were quite fascinated on how their organization had changed and others, we're not. And they said they'd never thought about Girl Guides except to eat the cookies. That was one of the quotes. And it was really interesting for them to think about um, what other things they might be doing and what that history was. Yeah, they talked about that quite a bit, actually. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, yes, certainly it does. It's just an interesting um, evolution to see particularly where that organization has ended up and also some of the um 
evolution between say um, Boy Scouts of Canada and Girl Scouts of Canada and and sort of this blurring of of who belongs to what and who should and always I believe and feel free to tell me if I'm wrong um, this idea that the girls should always sort of aspire to be like the boys or as strong as the boys but there's not as much of the other way that boys should somehow aspire to things that are good in the, the female gender and uh, i yeah go ahead and comment those on that. kinds of normative practices is kind of what you're talking about and i really don't know i haven't done any research into the boy scouts and some of the work that I think became really exciting about the Girl Guides in the early era to create a kind of uh, so-called girls only organization was a type of feminist act that has different implications today. It's not that we don't need feminism now, but it has different implications for what that looks like today and uh, how it was providing opportunities that girls might not have had in other spaces. One of the things that I think is interesting, um, you and Craig were both talking about wanting to do exercises, or maybe not wanting to, but feeling inspired to do exercises all by yourselves in front of your computers. I'm not inspired <laughs> to do that. I think that one of the things that's amazing about our research is that we really learned that what made these exercises and these kinds of, what ultimately ended up being dance, choreographed dance drills exciting was that girls were making them with each other and it was this collaborative thing. But in the early days of guiding, there was also something called a lone girl guide. And that was for the very isolated girls. And they could become girl guides and be a lone guide and mail in all of their information about themselves and get ideas about activities to work on alone. And uh, I found that very poignant. Um, so I'll think of you if you're doing your arm circles all by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah that is interesting and there is a comment in the chat that scouts canada has actually been co-ed since 1993 so that uh yeah puts a rest yeah. to what i said but yeah, I think that um, the the way that those organizations have diverged is is interesting. And like I said, I don't know as much about the scouts, and I don't know a lot about the work that's happening in you know the contemporary times either. <laughs> Obviously, I am not as up to date either. <laughs> uh, anyways, any further questions? We're a, we have about seven minutes <laughs> left. Um, as Heather had indicated, we could certainly finish early if you're trying to get your lunch going. But if anyone has any final questions, certainly feel free. Look at the Q&A as well. Uh, it sounds like you've sort of uh, addressed everybody's questions and so I thank you. This was really actually quite fun and quite interesting Good. to hear well, about I your know. research. Thanks. It's such an opportunity to get to share with the broad community some information that otherwise, you know, we're just kind of working in our own little niches and doing our own things. So the things that I take away a lot have to do with how important it is for doing, you know, collaboration and for working with young people and whatever kinds of methods work for, for people, but making sure that they have a voice and a say in how we conduct our research and how they influence the outcomes and the future trajectories of our communities. Those are the big things for me. Great. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, Craig, maybe are there, there's more presentations, right? Maybe you can speak to that. Yes, there are. There's there's still more presentations coming up um, uh, later this week and next week. And then, of course, uh, on April the 26th is a Student Research Day, which is kind of our our showcase event of uh, scholarship, uh, Celebration Scholarship Month. Great, thank you. That was our little plug. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just said super exciting. I can't wait to see what the young people, what the students have been working on. They're not all young, but all of our students, it's great. <laughs> I, I was in a different presentation that was talking about student transition to the workplace and, and the presenter did 
refer to them as emerging workers as opposed to young workers. So. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> makes good sense. Thanks everybody for being here today. It's such a privilege to share virtual space with all of you. <laughs> Thank you so much.